How's everybody today? Uh, let's see, let's do the announcements first. Sunday school after morning worship. And I've been mentioning these Maasai people lately. And the ladies group has uh, wants to improve our church's missionary uh, program, which already is very good, but going to get better. Now there's a poster back there that talks about the Maasai people. There are some pictures on there and the scriptures. They're right behind Dale. And here's the story. Ron and Brenda Anderson are the ladies group's missionary uh, for the month of April. Ron is the son of Lauren Anderson, who was a longtime missionary, one of the original or early ones who went down to Guatemala. And uh, Ron and Brenda Anderson, they met in Asbury College in Kentucky, studied nursing at the time, came into our conference and pastored in Iowa, and then went to the mission field in 1977 which is amazing. They work for ECM. We've had them for our missionaries of the month or of the week many times. And they planted churches in Spain, Portugal, and France. And they've also worked in the field. And uh, he's actually the um, head of European Christian missions. Now, five years ago, they met a man named Mark Marengia. And he's an East African um, consultation with 30 other pastors and uh, we actually met him on Zoom a few weeks ago and what they have is they rescue these, they have rescues for these girls um, in the Maasai community it's you know heavily Muslim and they still practice uh, genital, they call it circumcision on females and it's just this year alone, 11 of them have died from it. And it's a very strict thing with their religion that girls must be circumcised and, uh, and they arrange marriages. And so and it's common that a 13-year-old girl could be married to a 60-year-old man. And uh, of course, once they cons consummate that marriage, uh, if when the man dies, obviously she's uh, can't remarry, and so they just have very antiquated and very strict uh, rituals and such on their girls. And so this pastor Marenja, uh, who's from Africa, he started this rescue. And they've rescued hundreds of girls over the years. And uh, they had a few orphan, orphan girls and a few pastors and friends started this community-based organization to eliminate these harmful cultural practices of female sexual mutilation, forced child marriage, and they preached the gospel of Christ. In five years, they've rescued 800 girls and pastored five small churches. They have 53 orphan girls and three orphan boys in their school to the glory of God. So each year they struggle to find funds for rescue and schooling. And during the month of June, there will be 200 girls who will be running to the rescue center to keep from these female mutilations and forced marriages. Since January, they had 11 die from these. So the ladies are working on donating some of their funds toward the cost of Brenda Anderson's endeavor uh, and opening up to the church. A scholarship of these 53 orphan girls and three orphan boys is uh, $600 a piece, and the price of feeding these students is $200 a piece. The money is due by September, uh, November 1st, and uh, she said whatever donations would be a blessing. Full scholarships don't have to be paid. You don't have to have $600. Whatever you could do is good, and, uh, of course, they put it together with everything else they have and take care of these girls. And um, 
So churches you've united toward donating to this cause. We know the funds will get to where they're going because all funds are sent through Hannah Levy. She's the pastor's wife down in Allentown and uh, treasurer of the International Mission Board. And so she earmarks these funds for the project. So Brenda Anderson said it's a tremendous blessing and uh, she's really grateful that we would uh, consider this endeavor. So the ladies are developing this program and as you can see, you take a look there, there'll be a table back there next week and uh, let's see if we can help out people. <laughs> Anybody have anything else? All right. Let's turn in our hymnals to 203. <clears throat> Let's all stand as we say.
Last week the men read the first line. This week the women are going to read the first lines. And Mrs. Rupert, would you mind reading for the ladies? Leading the ladies in reading. Now we have the Sabbath for the dawn of the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the young Mary went to see the children. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you see Jesus, which is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, Come, to see the place where he lay. And then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going to the Lord of Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Thank you. You may be seated. Let's bow our heads, we'll have a word of prayer. What a great last line that is. We just read, Lord, in your word. Told the disciples to go up to Galilee, and there they would see you. We are so grateful that you have made yourself known to us after the resurrection. You appeared to over 500 people plus apostles, and finally to the Apostle Paul, as one born out of due season, as he says. And you've come and visited us by the Spirit of God. Our Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this great salvation that you have forgiven our sins, cleansed us from all unrighteousness, made us acceptable among the beloved, welcomed us into your family, we are card-carrying by the Spirit of God, members of the Kingdom of God. And so, Father, we'll thank you for all eternity for that. Our Heavenly Father, we're also grateful that you have made it known to us that you hear our prayers. And you respond to each and every one of them perfectly. Now, sometimes to us down here it feels like you don't hear. We ask for certain things. We wish certain things would happen. But we know that you see far broader and far deeper. And we are left to trust you. You've made yourself known as good, gracious, merciful. You've included us in this world. And likewise, our Heavenly Father, instead of watching from afar, us spiraling down here, so often out of control, such chaotic world, where death is the end game of everyone who walks the planet. But instead of sitting far away, you came down here and literally suffered with us, for us, and you were crucified on our behalf. But the good news is on the third day, just as we died in Christ, on the third day we live in Christ. Father, please speak to us about these things. And Father, we ask you to please help our friends and family. We have names on here of people who have lost loved ones in recent days and months. We also have friends and family who are going through very serious surgeries and uh, trying to recover from that. We just have all variety of things taking place in our lives, Lord, and we need help for each and every one. We ask you to bring healing where it be appropriate. We also ask you, our Heavenly Father, to give us the guidance, the wisdom, and the direction we need to be the people we ought to be down here in this world and live lives worthy of this great calling. We're praying for our friends down in Allentown. We thank you so much for Darren and Hannah 
And even as we heard this morning, she's the treasurer of the uh, International Mission Board, and Darren pastors that church down there, and uh, just a wonderful couple. We ask your deepest and richest blessing on them as they continue to work in that Allentown church where Reverend Ken Smith, and actually, Reverend Jesse Murphy, who was pastor of this church back in the 30s, planted that church. And Reverend Ken Smith took it for so many years, and now the livings are there. We ask your blessing upon them. Brian and Trish Fink, so grateful for their ministry to the Native American communities in Western Canada. We ask your blessing upon them that you continue to use them for your glory. We also think of our friend Ray Compton. And our Heavenly Father, we ask you to bring comfort and peace upon him. Soothe his heart. We're so grateful that he is so, so enjoys that evening cafe. We ask you to continue to speak to his heart and the hearts of so many who really don't get out and don't go to church one way or another. And our Heavenly Father, we pray that you continue to speak to their hearts, minister to them, make them to know that the that you love them and that you avail for them. So we pray for Ray and for all our seniors and for all those who are disabled. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for the United States Armed Forces. We pray for law enforcement agents, first responders. We pray for our postal workers. We pray for everybody who works together to make this a great society. We ask your deepest blessing on each one. We ask you for our leaders our national and local politicians. We pray that you'd help them to see what they need to see and do what they need to do. And we ask your hand upon each and every one of them. Our Heavenly Father, we could pray all day and it'd be a worthy enterprise. We're gonna lead our prayers for these and ask you to hear our prayers as we say together, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I think, let's see, Let's turn to 256. Hey, Nick, I don't know if you remember or not, folks, but uh, I can remember Jean Bell sitting over there, and she knew this was one of my favorite songs, and whenever I, this song would come up, Jean would smile, and what a, what a wonderful smile she had. I'm telling you, folks, we are so blessed People have gone before us and sat in these pews and uh, just been a blessing in our lives. 256. Might as well stand as we sing this one.
today. Okay, folks, back to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12. And I'm going to read a verse from the previous chapter. It's not in your bulletin, but I'm just going to read how the previous chapter ends and lead, leads us into this one. Gospel of Matthew, it's in the back of your bulletin, chapter 12, where it says at that time Jesus went through the grain fields. Um, there wasn't space to put a heading there. In the previous chapter, Jesus had said, Come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I'm gentle and lonely in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. Because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your holy word. We got our Heavenly Father, we just got through singing how we'll fly away one day to be with you. Presuming you don't come prior to that. And our Heavenly Father, the only reason to not believe those words is simply unbelief. You have told us that you've gone to prepare a place for us. You have told us that you will deliver us from this earth. The world it's locked into this world. Can't see past it. It doesn't understand spiritual things. And they've substituted the worldly philosophy for the Spirit of God. And so, Father, if we were trapped down here and all we could see is what we see down here in this world, sickness, death, man's inhumanity to man, sin, and all its ugly fruits. We'd be lost. But you have told us there are better things. And by faith, they are ours. Faith is in fact the very substance, the very reality. Faith takes us out of this world and into the kingdom of God. Would you please speak to us about this? Would you open our hearts and minds to put aside the things of the world and put our hearts in Jesus Christ's hand where his salvation and his life and his hope as dark and dour as this world can be there are great things ahead please speak to us in Jesus name Amen Now, what we just said Jesus said this, remember? He says, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, you've hidden these things from the wise and the understanding, and you've revealed them to little children. All right? The things in the kingdom of God have been hidden from the wise, hidden from the educated, hidden from the leaders and rulers of this world but they've been revealed to children, okay? In other words, the kingdom of God is not for the big winners in this world who have no time for the things of God. It's not for the people of this world who frankly don't believe in God because they're tied up with the things they see down here and choose to let that vision be their vision of eternity, and it's a dour one. It's a hopeless one. It's a lost one. 
If all you know is what you know down here in this world, you're out of business. You're headed for death. Everybody you've ever known is headed for death. All the disappointments and frustrations that this world brings, all the disappointments and frustrations that people bring into this world, that's all there is. But Jesus has come to this world and he said, Father, I'm so grateful that you have made the kingdom of God available to little children, to the humble, to the meek, to those who surrender their great authority and rulership over their lives. You've hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and you've revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such as was your gracious will, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. Get it? All things have been handed over to Jesus by his Father. That's why those old stories of the patriarchs are so important, and why the whole culture of the Bible featured in the Old Testament is so important because it leads us into this creative thing that God has put together and demonstrates how in that culture the Father was known by the Son and the Son was known by the Father. We live in a very different culture where we are independent, we're separate, we float our own boat, all right? But in that culture, what do they call Peter? Simon, son of Jonah, right? Everybody's known by their father's name. And that was so important. And Jesus said, in consistency with that culture, everything that this father's is mine. All things have been handed over to Jesus by my father. No one knows the Son except the Father. Remember what Peter said one day? Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what did Jesus say? Flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. My Father in heaven showed you that. That's something that the world cannot understand. The world, if you're stuck in this world, if you don't have revelation from high, if the Spirit of God doesn't guide you, that Jesus was crucified. He was buried, and somewhere around the, between the third day and the burial, his apostles stole his body, spirited her away somewhere, and put together the greatest hoax that has lasted all through history, that Jesus merely died like everybody else. Apostles stole the body, claimed him to be resurrected, and that's all there is. But by the Spirit of God, we know better. How do you know better, Reverend? You weren't there. You didn't go to the tomb on the third day. You've never met the apostles. You never sat across the table for the resurrected Jesus. You weren't there down at the shore after the resurrection when the apostles were out of their boats fishing and Jesus was on shore roasting fish over a fire and then called them in to join him. You weren't there. How in the world would you know? And the answer is because that same Jesus who came to these people came into my heart and absolutely changed my life. It's a personal experience that makes the difference between faith and unbelief, right? We talked about religion with this Messiah people. And they're just like everybody else in the world. We all rely on the things of this world and we rely on the culture we're familiar with. And in the culture these Jewish people were familiar with, how do you get to know God? You keep the Sabbath. And you don't violate it in any way, shape, or form. Sabbath was given by God, wasn't it? Right. All through history, God has given us, I believe, He's walking us through every single possible experience with God so that in the final day when Christ returns, man will have every single option there is. We had innocence, didn't we, in the Garden of Eden? That's the first culture the world knows of, is an innocent culture where there's been no sin, there's been no violence, no disobedience, no death, no deterioration, 
It's the Garden of Eden. I mean, it's fresh from creation. As new as it can get. But we're free will beings. And we always will be. And there will always be tests. And there will always be trial. The Apostle Peter wrote that, didn't he? He said, don't be surprised when difficulties and hardships come into your life. Just make sure they're not things that you brought into your own life, things that you caused by yourself. You don't even have to cause them yourself. The finest people you've ever known in your life have been tested and tried just like you, whether you know it or not. From the outside, we know people look, that look pristine. I had the privilege of meeting with uh, Alberta Penny, one of her nieces, uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, well, what happened was, uh, she was wondering where the family Bibles were. They used to be over on Lincoln Avenue. And Mary Beth said on Facebook, she goes, talk to our pastor, he might be able to help you. And she called me, or she, I guess she messaged me on Facebook, and lo and behold, I said, well, we don't have the family Bible, but your aunt's Bible's sitting on our pulpit. And it's highly symbolic lesson to anybody who cares. This is a beautiful Bible. Amen. This thing has been worn, you know why? Because Alberta Penny took this to heart. I read about a guy named Harold Bloom, and he always, Harold Bloom says, I read something to pieces. She literally read this thing to pieces. Look at it. I mean, if I was to just let it fly the way it is, it's all over the place. I told her she could have it. There's not really any family tree info in there. I said, you might, you're more than welcome to take it, it's yours. She says, no, I think it's right where it belongs. Alberta Penny, as innocent looking a person as you have ever seen in your life, but she was deeply, deeply conscious that sin was a prowling lion <clears throat> looking to master her. You know, that's a powerful thing, folks. The closer you get to Christ, probably the more intense temptations become. Jesus can't get much closer to God than Jesus, right? And yet he was tempted in every single way as we are, yet without sin. The devil himself left his other business to come and personally tempt Jesus at his weakest point 40 days and 40 nights without water, without bread. Biologists or scientists tell us you can't live like that, but you can. The people have done it through the ages. Jesus at his weakest point was tempted. Hey, Jesus, you don't have to go through this suffering. You don't have to go through this. Turn that bread and turn those stones into bread. You're the son. Aren't you the son of God? I mean, if you're really the son of God, why don't you do it? And of course, the answer screams through history. I came to seek and to save the lost. I came to suffer on your behalf. I came so that you're not alone. I came so that you don't have to live down here in this world forever. But there's a day of flying away because I've come to bring it to you. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. What does he mean? How do you do that? How do you do take the yoke of Jesus upon you? How do you learn of him? Well, I got a great idea. Let's read the very next things that Jesus has in the Gospel of Matthew, and we'll see if our answer is there. Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. That Sabbath, I said, we were in this era of innocence in the Garden of Eden. And then we sort of went through an era of just, all right, we'll just let people live. We'll just let things go. We're not going to try and control things. We'll just let them go. And Cain killed his brother Abel. And by Genesis chapter 6, God said, I wish I'd never created the earth. And then he says, you know what, here's let's, let's do this now for a while. Let's wipe the earth clean of people. Noah is a good man. Let's just get him, his family, eight souls, 
put them on the ark, get rid of everybody else. And we'll see how that does for the human race. And shortly after Noah was off the ark, we find Noah drunk. We find people doing the things they always did. Didn't change anybody. And then God called Abraham and said, Abraham, through you, I'm going to bless the whole world. And then 400 some years later, he gave the law. And the laws were given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Remember, he got tablets of stone from God. God carved with his finger the Ten Commandments. And there's Moses standing with them in his hand. He didn't even get down to the bottom of the mountain and he saw that the codification of the Ten Commandments will make no difference. The people were already in wild pagan worship. He smashed the commandments through the ages. He raised up prophets. And what did the prophets say? I made a covenant with you that if you'd obey me, I'll bless you. And if you disobey me, you'll be cursed. And how did God's chosen people do with that? They were deported to Babylon. They were overrun by the Assyrians because they couldn't keep, because we couldn't keep the covenant. If all your religion is is a bunch of commandments, and rules and laws and Bible memory and stuff like that, if that's all it is, folks, that's just discipline with a Christian facade. That's called Stoic philosophy. And it has various forms, and it doesn't have anything to do with salvation. God has demonstrated that we need something more. They went through the grain fields on the Sabbath that was given in the law by God for a purpose at that time. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. Pharisees saw it and they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what's not lawful to do on the Sabbath. They're harvesting grain. They're rubbing it in their hands. That's not law. Actually, God told people in the beginning to keep the seventh day holy. Because on the seventh day, God rested. But we added laws and rules and regulations to make sure nobody gets away with breaking the laws of God. We find in the Old Testament, people found gathering sticks on the Sabbath. And the people gathered around and said, what shall we do? And the Lord himself said, you're people of the law. What do people of the law do when you gather sticks on the Sabbath? He needs to be stoned. And they stoned excuse me, stoned the man to death because he broke the religious law. Sound repulsive to you? Does that sound repugnant? Does that sound like some, the God we know? Or does that sound like maybe a father who tells his children, you're not old enough to drive the car. Don't drive the car. When I go to the grocery store, don't go taking the keys and drive off with a car. Drive around the neighborhood, drive up to school, drive somewhere. You don't have a license. You're not old enough. You really don't know what you're doing. Oh, I know what I'm doing. And you jump in the car. And before long, you're in the ditch. Or you're in a telephone pole. Or you sideswipe your neighbor's car. And Dad says, I told you, and I told you, and I told you. And you didn't listen. Now what have you done? That's what God does in our lives. He gives us enough rope to hang ourselves, doesn't he? He gives us enough string to find out where the end is. He says, is this what you really want? And many of us found out at the end of that string, there's no life at all. And there's no joy at all. And what started out to be a blast ends up to be a catastrophe, ends up to be a nightmare. We call it our society. And it's on every single page of every single newspaper all over the world. 
the things we bring to pass in this world because we thought we could go to the end of the string and get away with it. Champions of the law, the scribes and the Pharisees, aha! You who claim to be the Messiah, and here you are watching your disciples harvesting grain on the Sabbath. If you were the Messiah, because we know the Messiah has come to what? To enforce the law. To force people to do the things that are right. And to curse. And to throw away. And to get rid of. And to damn to hell. Everybody who doesn't toe the line. That's what the Messiah has come to do. And they couldn't figure out Jesus. His disciples were hungry. And he said, go ahead and harvest that grain if that's what they want to call it. Go ahead and take care of yourselves. Feed yourselves. You're hungry. And they came and said to Jesus, how come you let your disciples do what's not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said, haven't you read what David did when, when he was what? Had a spear to his throat? Had a knife in his back? And people said, you eat that bread from the temple that you're not supposed to touch or I'm going to run you in. No. His followers were hungry. And he said, go ahead. He went to the priest and said, hey, you got anything here to eat? All I've got is the show bread. All I've got is this ceremonial bread. Only the priests are allowed to eat it. But there's something more needed here is to take the bread and eat it. Jesus said, didn't you read about that? That exceptions are made for human need? Don't you remember that on the Sabbath, if your ox falls in the ditch, somebody should go and pull him out. You don't leave the ox to suffer in the ditch. You don't mind when people suffer, do you? You treat your animals. That's where the law leads us. It leads us to an impersonal place where there's no compassion because the law is either you do it or you don't. If we really enforce the law, we got a 15 mile an hour speed limit out there. And I wonder how many people sitting here wouldn't be having a Christmas tree full of tickets because you went 16 miles an hour or 18 miles an hour or went crazy and hit 25. The law has no exceptions, and it will not save. All it does is damn, because we are not capable of keeping the law. One time, when I was shortly after I was saved, my dad said, uh, Alan, I got a, something, a project maybe you'd do for me. Uh, the catalytic converter on the Chrysler, um, I want to put a straight pipe on there. I want to take that catalytic converter off of there and put a straight pipe in. Would you mind doing that this afternoon? Ah, oh, Dad, I can't. I was just saved. <laughs> Today, I think I'd probably do it. Dad said so. Break the law. That's the way Rupert rolls. But at the time, I says, Dad, I can't do that. So what do you mean you can't do it? And I says, well, it's against the law. And Dad said, you're, you're, you're not, you're not kidding, are you? He wasn't very happy about it. Well, at the time, I had a 71 Olds Vista Cruiser with a tail light that I had rigged up. It was kind of a farm arrangement on the one side. And uh, Dad said, you don't, drive in your, you don't mind driving your car around. You think that thing's legal? You think if they inspected that closely that you'd be able to drive that? Don't worry about it. Forget it. I don't want you to do it now. I'll take care of it myself or I'll do something different. Forget about it. And he is right. We're all in violation of laws. We don't even know our laws. Well, laws will never save us. Discipline will never save us. And so Jesus said to them, I tell you something greater than the temples here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you wouldn't have condemned the guiltless. What does he say? For the Son of Man is the Lord also of the Sabbath. 
You know what Jesus is saying when he says that? Jesus is saying, I'm superior to that law that you think is going to get you into heaven. I am the giver of that law. Again and again in the Gospel of John, we hear the words, ego and me. That's Greek for I am. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the door. And there's no other. <coughs> and, this, and, the, and the Jews picked up stones to kill him. They got the picture. He was making himself equal with God. That's what they said. And now Jesus is saying, I am. I am the Son of Man, and I am the lawgiver. And we're moving on. We've gone through enough history to prove that man can't be saved by keeping the law. That man can't be saved by pulling himself up by his own bootstraps. That man can't be saved by being very rigid and very religious and very scrupulous. Because man's incapable of keeping that law. And so the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. And what's his law? Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. It's called forgiveness. It's called mercy. And that's what Hosea said. Three times we have this in the, in the Bible at least. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. God gave the sacrificial system in part so that we would see that the sacrificial system will never take away a sin. No blood from a bull, no blood from a goat. No genitive mutilation to any of her daughters. No forced marriage. No making sure that because women, are, this is what's behind the Messiah philosophy, okay? This is what's really behind the philosophy of life. Men rule the world. Men are appointed by God to be overseers of the world. And women, you're the problem. We get it all square, but you women constantly lead us astray. You get Joyce over here, she puts on these sequins and puts on this nice green blouse, gets her hair done every Friday, and we all know what that's all about. She's leading every one of you men down a poor Len, the road he's gone down, and there's no return. That's what women do. They use their sexual wiles to lead every last one of us astray. And what's the answer to that? Let's clamp down on women. Let's make sure that women can't use the things that God has given them wrongly. And we may have to compromise them using it rightly, but so be it. Because our only hope is to keep the law. And if we're going to keep the law, we've got to get people like you, who's the problem, and keep you under control. And that's why you should be here with a veil. All right? Or you should be better yet. You go down, we're talking about Walmart this morning. Go down to Walmart. And you get you one of them real, I, I'm not talking about the little leaguers who... You know, they wear some kind of a headgear. I'm talking about the ones who got full body black down to the ankles so that you don't see the ankles because you know where that'll lead. And then you get to look through a little screen like this big. Have you ever seen those? They get a screen this big, that's all. And you can't see their eyes because you know once a woman bats her eyes at you, Rob Johnson, you turn to powder. You're pudding in the hands of Jane, right? So we better cover her eyes and put a screen on there and then we'll be able to keep a sane and safe society. Now along the way, some of our daughters are going to have to die, but that's the price we pay to satisfy God because that's the way God is. And he's given us the law and if we don't keep it, we all go to hell. And I don't know what's going to happen with you women. Uh, only the virgins up there are the ones I heard of. The seven virgins that I'm waiting on. 
With a peanut gallery going off down here. I can't see any difference. What's that? The law. The law that you're talking about, Sounds like it's supposed to be God, but it sells, to me it sounds like the devil. Absolutely right! <laughs> Did you hear what he said? It sounds like the devil. So, if I can determine that, why can't anybody else? <laughs> why doesn't everybody get saved? How come this room isn't full right now? How come we don't have four services every Sunday to accommodate the people of German and Mayfield and the surrounding area? Because without the Spirit of God, you cannot understand spiritual things and you're locked into this world. And the philosophy of that community says, the only way to heaven is to try and control sin. And the only way to control sin is to control women, just like Eve. <laughs> she took Adam down the road and look where we are now. And we need to get you women how dare Mary Harvey look so nice with those? I love her earrings. She's great with earrings. And it's just a road to hell, right? And why doesn't everybody understand it? Because you can't understand spiritual things without the Spirit of God. And you'll never get the Spirit of God until you listen to Jesus and listen to his reasoning. They were hungry. Take care of them. Keep the Sabbath next Sunday. Oh, the Sabbath has a place. As was Jesus' custom, every Sabbath he went to the synagogue, and the Bible says he stood up, stood up to read, as was his custom. Sure, these laws all have a place. And they, re they reveal to us how sinful we are. They reveal to us how weak we are. That's what the Apostle Paul like our Paul here, he wrote to the Romans, and he said, God did, Christ did what the law couldn't do. What was wrong with the law? It was weak because of the flesh. The law, it's a glory of God. It's given by God. It's magnificent. The problem isn't the law. The problem is us. And that's why Jesus said, you've got to come unto me, all you labored, heavy laden. I can give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And what do I do? Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. I came to bring forgiveness. That's your only salvation. That's why we have crosses all over this place. That's why we celebrate Easter. That's why we celebrate Good Friday. That's why, we, that's why your Bible has four Gospels in it. Those four Gospels, they all tell the story of what? Jesus coming into this world, Jesus being rejected by this world, Jesus being crucified by this world. Because why? Because he broke the Sabbath. And then he had the nerve to make himself equal with God by saying, there's one greater than the temple here. There's one greater than the Sabbath here. The book of Hebrews says he's greater than the angels. The book of Hebrews says he's greater than Moses. The book of Hebrews says he's greater than the temple itself. All the ceremonies and sacrifices, no bull or goat ever washed away a sin. The blood of Jesus is greater than all of that. So come unto me and learn what it means. The Spirit of God, as Hosea said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The prophets came and said, you were given the law, but the law has only revealed your sinfulness. Come unto me for forgiveness, for mercy, for grace. And that's why we worship Jesus, because he has brought mercy and forgiveness. What's mercy and forgiveness? Mercy and forgiveness is Alan Rupert Sr. looking down at his son, Alan Rupert Jr. and saying, son, You've done just about everything you could think of. I don't know, to rebel or whatever it is you're doing. But I still love you. But I want the best for you. But I think the world of you. But I won't give up on you. Why, Dad? I, I, after all the violation? Yeah, I know about it all. But see, this is called mercy. 
That's why Jesus hung from the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's why Jesus hung from the cross and said to that thief on the left, he didn't say, you got the nerve to come to me at this time? I mean, a fire escape salvation? Huh, how dare you, you loser? You broke every law there is and you're hanging justly. You said so yourself. Well, we don't worship that man. The man we worship said, today you'll be with me in paradise. You learn what it means to feel sorry for your sins, and that's what repentance is. And that's why I gave the law. And the law has you hanging here, and you've learned the lesson, and heaven is for you. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your holy word. Because again, Lord, we by instinct want to control our own destiny. And so, the philosophies of this world range from, well, I'm innocent, I never really did anything wrong, and compared to everybody else, I'm okay. And the philosophies of the world, they take up a law or some form of the law, even the Bible itself, and make it the source of our righteousness. But Jesus came into this world to say those things, they don't make you righteous. <coughs> They end up making you cruel. They end up making you treat women like they're not even human. They end up making you treat oxen like they're better than people. Now the law just shows you how lost you are. I came to set you free. This world shows you where your true destiny is. It's death. Sin has brought sickness and suffering and pain and sorrow and separation. Inhumanity, a man, and ultimately death. And there's no salvation down here. It has to come from on high. Jesus came and said, I am the door. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I have been given authority to lay my life down. And I've been given authority to take it up. I've been given the authority to reveal my Father to whoever I choose. And I'm choosing to reveal my Father to little children. Literally and figuratively. Not to the wise and self-sufficient, but to the meek and humble, who will humble themselves before God and receive eternal life by a matter of forgiveness and mercy and the gift of God. Speak to me in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, ladies and gentlemen, let us turn in our hymnals to uh, 554. <laughs>
thank you so much for sending Jesus into this world and not leaving us as orphans to try and figure things out for ourselves. But we find ourselves in all kind of a mess. But Jesus came with mercy, with forgiveness, that brings life and light and takes the yoke and burden of salvation off of us, a burden and a yoke that we could never ever bear, incapable of, and puts it on the one who could. His name is Jesus. Speak to us about these things. We'll thank you forever. It's in his eternal name that our salvation has been purchased and been given to us as a holy gift by God himself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.